Um, hello. Yeah. You know, I heard there was a talk called Beautiful Scala that was canceled for some reason. That's... <laughs> I find that suspicious. I can imagine proposing that talk in a burst of enthusiasm and as the date came closer and closer, starting to panic and then like, oh man, I don't know what happened. The flight was canceled. Um, so Ed, Ed Lattimore uh, came up here and admitted that it was his first time public speaking, which if uh, you know how great most people's fear of public speaking is, is a pretty brave thing to do. So I felt like a in the same spirit, I should admit to something. Um, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> so I had to retitle this talk because I didn't know what the word abstraction meant. How about that? <laughs> um, so that's, yeah, be careful who you take advice from. Um, but uh, that's actually gonna be about half the talk is like sort of what I discovered reading about abstraction and related notions. And then the other half is gonna forget all that and actually go for something super interesting, I think. Um, we'll see. So everybody here knows that as you look around, there's more and more projects that are being done in a way that we could actually say approximates rigor. Um, which is really nice. Like, uh, if you're young, you don't know how it used to be. Like we didn't even used to use version control when I was a kid, and that's no joke. Like, just don't you know? Just copy it over here, man. It was crazy. We have uh, wild times. <laughs> uh, but in the the slow march of progress, there's now a bunch of stuff we take for granted. Like you'd be, you know, you look at somebody like they were completely nuts if they didn't use version control. And in the future, people will look at you completely nuts if you don't have a bunch of laws that constrain your code. So that, you know, seeing that progress is heartening. But uh, the number of places in which that sort of progress is introduced is a little bit reductionist. It's like it's down, you know, we have these like low level sort of mathematical abstractions, um, you know, very straightforward things like um, you know, it's a monoid, so therefore, you know, we'll obey these very simple laws. There's an identity, etc. cetera. Um, but when you start talking about your higher level sort of notions, the things that really make or break a large project, um, there's, you don't see a lot of people actually exploiting like the mathematical abstractions. We start heading into like, well, you know, I understand this domain and this is the thing that we're going to use. Um, and my thesis is that this is still like giving up too soon. We can actually, uh, there's a lot of uh, constraints implied by uh, the constraints that we already choose. And if we knew what they were, we would choose those automatically. And that would be one more place that we can't do it wrong. We can, we can do what they call mining. Um, and so usually like, you know, data mining is a thing, right? Like that's a whole like area, right? But we can do a sort of a more uh, refined, uh, like a, you know, a more sophisticated, like uh, uh, connoisseur style of mining. We can mine like concepts uh, out, of, out of the ether of information, um, concepts that are implied by the nature of our data, and then we can use them. Um, and this to me is a really, uh, exciting notion. So that's what this is going to be going on. An ad hocicity or possibly ad hocicity. It's not officially a word, um, but it ought to be because it's, it's truly like the sort of the, the axis upon which most people uh, flutter most freely. So the, the, the ax joke that, that is everywhere in these slides is, of course, um, that axes is the plural of axis. Um, but also axes looks like, I guess it's a homograph, uh, looks like axes. So that lets me take all kinds of ax quotes and ax pictures and pretend they're relevant. And that's, you know, such is the basis of humor as I understand it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I especially like this definition of axis, which was not necessarily written with the, um, the complex number plane in mind, an imaginary line that divides something into equal or roughly equal halves. Um, now, it's, it's great to imagine the person who sat there staring at the reels and going like, what am I going to do, man? And then just like, whoa, you know, I could just like carve this thing up and like a, a 
put this completely imaginary thing in there, and then I have a solution. I'm done. This is great. Just I pull it out of the sky, and that's I. I think that's a great innovation. Um, and of course, that sort of opens the door to all kinds of nutty stuff that doesn't actually buy you anything. But I guess we can all agree that complex numbers are worth something. Um, the joke up there is that the first guy, the heron of Alexandria, is like the first guy that shows any awareness of the possibility of complex numbers. And the second guy is one of the key guys who actually made complex numbers part of mathematics. Uh, not that he invented it, but uh, he, was, he had a lot of credibility. <laughs> Gauss. And uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how many of you could possibly get this joke, but a few of you do. There's no doubt in my mind. So there's this thing called quaternions, which is a further generalization of uh, of it's it's R four instead of R two. Like you know, the complex numbers are have two axes: um, the real number line and then and then the i. But in quaternions, there's four axes. Um, and Hamilton is the guy in the the image in the background you see there who was walking along somewhere and just was suddenly possessed by exactly how this needed to work. And so he went and he carved it into the bridge. And so there's a plaque there. And this is the plaque in the bridge showing like where he had his moment of inspiration. Um, now he'd be you know, arrested. But in, in those days, you could do that sort of thing. <laughs> All right, so when I proposed this talk, A, not really knowing what the word abstraction meant, um, and uh, uh, B, just you know, like needing something that would be a rich vein of material. Um, I thought that I would you know, just talk about lots of things along the lines of complex numbers, which is to say, like, here's this place where you could just like, sort of dream up a way of partitioning the, the universe into these things and those things, and then exploit that in some useful way. Um, and so these are some sort of straightforward axes such as they are parametricity which everybody knows because that's like the sort of the, the, the queen mother of of uh, it is um, arity you know which is <clears throat> essentially uh, uh, abstracting over the uh, number of arguments to something um, or darity which is I got that from um, from sell out uh, Greg file uh, as a note as a word I needed a word for abstracting over you know rank and um, opacity, which I think is better than boxity, which is what, so you'd think, bo I thought boxity would mean uh, like whether it's boxed or not, but actually uh, Eugene of the Scala macros uh, would call something boxity the notion of whether it's a white box or a black box macro. So I'm not sure that's the most transparent terminology. <laughs> But, but op not that opacity is the most transparent terminology, huh? Uh, <laughs> uh, but in any case, uh, there's still a useful notion, right? That there's that like how much you can see into the internals of a thing um, is something that we could vary over and you know deal with differently in different situations. And then inductivity, which is supposed to just sort of capture this notion of induction versus co-induction. Um, but of course, that's just the beginning. And then, then we have these really nice, like low-level ones: um, associativity, commutativity, distributivity, idempotency. Invertibility, and then like then this one I learned about recently in the context of what they call tropical rings, selectivity, which is like idempotence, but it's even stronger. Which it says like you have a binary operation, you've got a op b, the result will always be either a or b, um, and of course naturally that's idempotent since the next time you do it you would just get a versus a, which of course is, has to be a since your only choices are a and a. Um, but it's, uh, if you have a property that strong, you can get some really interesting stuff out of it. Um, like, for instance, max or min on, on integers is, is, obeys this property. So anyway, lots of stuff there. Again, won't be talking about any of that. This is all the cutting room floor we're talking about right now. Um, longevity, which is actually a thing, right? I mean, I rest, rest, I think, missed an opportunity by not talking about longevity. I, I guess they say lifetimes. Um, but, you know, everything should be an it or it's not worth talking about as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Evitability, which um, I, I it's, so, you know, uh, CATS, for instance, has an eval class that gives you either it's already been evaluated, it will be evaluated every time you reference it, or it'll be evaluated once, right? So th its evitability is a, you know, like, will it ever be evaluated? I don't know. Is it inevitable, or is it just evitable, or is it, you know, <laughs> semi-evitable? <laughs> Classity is actually, I think, a really cool idea that we don't see enough of. Like, so 
we talk about like first class functions, right? If something can be a value that you can, uh, you know, assign at runtime, it's like it's first class and you can manipulate it all these interesting ways. But l little understood, I think, is how all the negatives of being first class. Um, because first class, you know, basically means you cannot analyze at compile time exactly what's going to happen at runtime. You need second classness for that. And so actually being able to abstract over the classity of something such that you could have first class when you want it, but not have it when you don't need it, because that's, you know, from extra power comes extra pain, um, would be uh, very useful. And then we have quotidity, which I thought was the closest thing I could think of for sort of layers of nesting. Actually, quotidity is a word that means something unrelated, so it's, you know, but we actually like to confuse people. It's, I, I don't mind, so it's a good word. All right, but forget all that stuff, because I actually have a different idea in mind. And here we're heading toward that. But first, I, since I learned what abstraction means, you have to learn what abstraction means. Maybe you already know. Um, and another admission I should make here is that most of this next section is original material, which means it risks being just like outrageously, offensively wrong. Um, n nobody has actually endorsed any of this except for me. But I mean, it kind of, it holds together for me, so uh, we'll see. Oh, so this is just a little brief example where uh, we're just going to watch um, a, a, the, the, the lamest form of generalization, but something you really want to have cognizance of. Um, it's really easy to overspecify uh, what you need from your inputs. Um, and by doing so, to really limit, so there you have two like, bad consequences from that at least. One is that you limit the applicability of your function, but the second is that the space of solutions, the space of implementations is much, much greater. Like if, a, if you're acting on an argument that is this extremely complicated thing, then you could be doing anything in there that takes advantage of a complicated thing. But if you're acting on an argument that's a very simple thing, you can only see the simple aspect of it. You can't be using all the rest of the complication of the incoming thing. And that's a big deal for somebody looking at the code. They know that it's for, you know, if it comes in and only it takes the monoid, then it isn't doing anything that you can't do with only a monoid. Um, and that's a very reassuring thing to know about a function. So here we go. This is like, so this is the outrageously overspecified function right here. Um, the argument has to be five. Uh, this is actual syntax right here in Scala if you have the right compiler options. The, the argument has to be, f this won't compile if you say, if you try to return type 11. And other, like it's, you know, because five plus five is 10, the only type you can return here is 10 or some weaker type of 10, right? Um, so generally we wouldn't write, we would know this was overspecified. Um, usually it's not quite this obvious, but this is the intentionally obvious example. Um, here is a little nicer. Uh, we're taking an int, we're adding it to another int. But addition and multiplication on the, almost the operations on the natural numbers have a huge number of sort of uh, accidental aspects. They're, they're kind of, the, there's all these generalizations of them that are now reasonably well understood where they are sort of the, the trivially collapsed version of that. Um, but taking in, having those properties available without using them is again like overspecifying your inputs. So, for instance, we don't actually need to know that these are numbers at all um, because, uh, well, actually, I guess we've got one more. We, we can allow them to be different kinds of numbers, and that's a hypothetical syntax there, but we could imagine that there was a sensible hierarchy in Scala of inheritance and that ints and other things all were, you know, inherited from number, and they would all have an addition operation. And so now we are much, you know, we are applicable to more things, and we further constrain the implementation. But now we can just say, why numbers, right? Like, we could just be, you know, anything that has some notion of, you know, now a commutative ring is a very specific, because I'm, as you will see as I continue with this, I'm just going to keep stripping away unnecessary assumptions. Um, but the commutative ring is, is, you know, effectively, we were assuming a specific commutative ring before um, of the natural numbers, and now we're just saying any commutative ring is fine. And then we'll just pull back a little further because, you know, we don't actually care if it's commutative and we don't actually care if it has an identity. And in fact, it doesn't need to be a ring. It could be just a group because we're only using addition, not multiplication. Um, and in fact, that doesn't need to be commutative either. And furthermore, we don't actually need an inverse because we're not doing subtraction. So a monoid is sufficient, but actually a semigroup is sufficient because we're not needing an identity either. We're just adding these two things. 
Um, and even a magma is enough because actually we don't even really care what we're doing here, whether it's associative, we're just adding these two things. We're combining them in some unspecified way, whatever. And then we run out of stuff and now it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm just gonna read you this quote because you know, there's no better way to like kill your time than to just you know, read from uh, Hofstadter. <laughs> <laughs> this is a marvelous idea. It suggests that when we try to understand nature, we should look at the phenomena as if they were messages to be understood, except that each message appears to be random until we establish a code to read it. This code takes the form of an abstraction. That is, we choose to ignore certain things as irrelevant, and we thus partially select the content of the message by a free choice. In other words, we impose order upon the world ourselves in, in what becomes an unconscious process merely by what we choose to notice, um, which is kind of a, you know, one of those like, whoa, concepts, right? Because like, imagine what life is like for a baby. I guess it's pretty different, right? Uh, you know, it's hard to say. We can't really converse with them. But I bet, you know, like they have a much less clear idea about like where one thing stops and the next thing starts, for instance, right? You know, the, the sort of the, the distillation into, you know, the stable concepts and just the confusion of inputs uh, is, is yet to entirely take place. So here, these definitions played into my particular conceit that motivates this talk here, so that I, that's why I chose them. I, I don't know if they're from just some guy or from some great thinker on this matter. Um, but their definitions, taken verbatim but with my emphasis, are that abstraction is an emphasis on the idea, qualities, and properties rather than the particulars, but especially, and this is the part that you see in any definition of abstraction, is a suppression of detail. Whereas generalization is a broadening of application to encompass a larger domain of objects of the same or different type. So how are these things related to one another? Here's my extremely pithy two-word definitions, which feels like an achievement of some kind. Abstraction is ignoring differences, and generalization is expecting differences. Um, and you can, in fact, abstract slash generalize from there and think of the world at large and problems that we try to solve in those two ways. It's kind of interesting. Um, but abstraction is when you notice that these, you know, bats, whales, mice, and humans have enough in common that they're all this kind of the same thing from if you, if, you know, dim the lights just right. They're all mammals and generalization is what you have to do when someone discovers the platypus. <laughs> so this idea of suppressing detail, you know, we can, we can make that more rigorous. Um, uh, there's this idea of uh, an equivalence relation, which is this, uh, a thing which will tell us like when one thing is the same as some other thing. And we can equip a set with an equivalence relation and get a different set. It's a, a smaller set uh, usually, which is to say, we're going to say which things are the same and which things are different. And then we're just going to cluster all the things that are the same into a big lump and say, that's one thing. And then by, by our choice of equivalence relation, we have a tremendous amount of power about the nature of that set. Um, and that is really like, that's what suppressing detail means. To say that like this thing is the same as this thing if these things are true is to ignore everything else about it except those things that you decided were what mattered. Um, and so in that sense, uh, uh, e equivalence classes and quotient sets, which is the set you get after you uh, kick it around with your equivalence relation, uh, is, is abstraction. Um, and that, that line about positioning, dimming the lights, I, I got from this great paper called When is uh, One Thing Equal to Some Other Thing? which is this very, very full of like painful category theory if you're not like very well versed in category theory, but um, really sort of gets at the, what I now consider to be the heart of what it, all this is all about. Like, like everything ends up coming down to equality. Like when, like literally the question that's being asked, when is one thing equal to some other thing? Like so much of mathematics category theory, but all mathematics comes down to that question. And it's, it really behooves us to be very serious about that question every time it comes up. So here's just an example of uh, putting that to work. The set of natural numbers, we can decide like our, our equivalence classes are going to be this thing is equal to that other thing if, they're, if we take modulus of one and, and they're the same. So that means that everything is either zero or one and there are no other things. If it, 
if it's, if it's five, it's actually it's one. If it's 22, it's actually zero. And so there's only two things in our, in our quotient set, and they're these big giant sets of things, but they're just one thing. You know, we can you know, just pick one and like that's the one. I'm sorry? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Sorry. Well, this is what you this is what you get, right? So definitely nobody check that. Modulo two, of course. Of course. I'm I'm not a very smart person. <laughs> so I'll fix that in the slides, I promise. Um, so we have objects B, C, and D. We notice, and that, that little sign there is like in Scala, that means it's a subtype of, but actually we don't need it to be quite like that. We're just going to say that like there's some sort of deterministic process by which we can think of a B as an A. Um, so an implication arrow might be, might be better, but I thought that was also overly like, you know, overspecified. So we'll just say that like this B, this C, and this D, I mean like look, they're all, they're all A's if we think of it in this whatever way. And then in this way, A now abstracts B, C, and D. Whereas we have some property which will tell us whether a thing is a B. And then we notice that like, you know, through some manipulation of that property or through some other property which collapses down to our original property, we could classify more things. And so we can say that this one generalizes R. And so note the contravariance that the thing is on the left side of the arrow now instead of the right because, you know, this is, I say it's in bold because this is going to be like the whole thing that I'm going to claim here. That the difference between abstraction and generalization really is not much more than the arrow, whether it is the thing on the right or the thing on the left. Um, and of course, if you are into the whole categorical view of things and uh, you know that these dualities come up all over the place. Um, and this particular one I will characterize as being the, the duality between extension and intention. Here's a nice little chart. So uh, extension is like basically like the things, I, I have things and intention is like I know what things look like. <laughs> So, you know, if I, have, if I have like, you know, three things and I point them out, those are the things, that's the extent, right? But if I, if I have a thing that will tell me whether a given thing is the, a thing, that's the intent. Um, and so these sort of uh, divide everything. Um, here we have, a, down toward the bottom, we see a set of A's versus an indicator function. An indicator function is, a, you know, an A to Boolean, basically. It's like a thing that will tell you if it's an A. Um, and being and doing uh, come from one of those crazy Connor McBride experiments, I think, um, Frank. So it's a language that actually like, makes a strong distinction between um, data and codata. And so you have like values and you have computations, right? Uh, the distinctions that we don't really see enough of. Um, but the general notion here is that there are, there's like two kinds of things. There's things on the right of the arrow and there's things on the left of the arrow. And it comes up in, in many, many different ways. Then at the bottom there where you have objects and attributes and that's going to be critical for the next section because we're finally going to get to the thing that I thought was cool that we're leading up to. I, I wish I'd thought of just, just taking screenshots of my own tweets and having this captive audience and just being able to go like, now, let me explain this one, right? Because the worst thing about Twitter is people not getting your jokes. I, I'm still bitter years later from, from 50 is the new L, um, getting zero retweets. I mean, that's really, that's really, come on, 50 is the new L. Come on, come on, thank you. Thank you. That's going to that's gonna sustain me for many, many years, that, that half-hearted almost <laughs> applause. <laughs> um, but this, this particular one, so I love this because I just stumbled across this, but what's, what makes this, this idea great is that the stalactite is, um, is defined in terms of a process, but the stalagmite in terms of a thing. Right, like that's, that's why this is positioned as codata versus data, right? It's dripping, but it's a drop, right? And then that's like just, it, you know, it's not like they were thinking about codata, I don't think, back in, you know, stalagmite days. But still, <laughs> still, it's like, you know, you, you start seeing this stuff everywhere and you can't help it. Um, oh, and this is just a good example of like, Generalization. So this stuff makes me laugh. This is a, this is an actual function. That's an actual function with an actual comment from um, from actual Scala. And whenever I see somebody writing to do generalize this on something called LP parazygohisto M, <laughs> I I know that I'm out of my league for one thing. But 
also, there's like truly no limit to the number of ways you can find to like, you know, chop things up a little further and let, let fewer assumptions take hold. All right, so now that we have this idea of there being extension and intention, um, we would like to not have them at odds. We would like to find like where they come together, where they're the same thing. And in fact, there is like a, effectively a science of this where extension meets ex intention. But first, what's this? You can actually answer this. Oh, you think it's a bird. <laughs> so, so people see this and, I, and you know, it's not a trap. They often do think it's a bird. Um, it's supposed to make you think of a bird. Um, it's interesting though uh, that it's both like wildly overspecified for actually representing a bird, right? Um, there's a lot going on here that is not necessary to be a bird. <laughs> and, and also, it's just a line, which probably makes it underspecified. I mean, you can't tell that that's like, you know, a, a creature with feathers, for instance. So you don't know it's not a bat. I'm not sure, you know. It's like, you're actually capitalizing on this, this shared notion of like what a bird looks like, which is, again, kind of interesting. But so we have this like idea of both you can overspecify and you can underspecify. Also, so in category theory, there's this idea of freeness. Um, which is where you have like a free object is one that sort of obeys the necessary laws, but no more. It doesn't bring extra structure. It's like it lets you do everything that you could possibly do under the set of laws that are applicable. So I really wanted to find a way to tie the free object to the bird. And I, I couldn't actually come up with, <laughs> I couldn't actually come up with a joke for this. So I'm just going to say, yeah. <laughs> Now, conversely, uh, rather than our line drawing, we could try to uh, define a bird by just firing off a series of yes-no things, right? Like, here are, let me just start naming properties that, that the thing obeys, and maybe we can converge on bird, right? So, you know, here you have your very unhelpful friend answering your questions. It has wings? Uh, okay, a dragonfly? No. It isn't an insect. Is it a bat? No. It lays eggs. It, oh, it's a pterosaur. Uh, no, it is not a dinosaur. Okay, it's a platypus wearing a bird costume. It, no, it flies. Okay, it's a platypus in a bird costume in a hot air balloon. No, it has feathers. It's an avian drone. Um, the, the problem here, of course, is that we, you know, it takes a long time to fully specify a thing. In other words, to what we, the idea here is like maybe if we had enough things that we could, through the, through the statement of properties, uh, converge upon the set of all birds, right? We would get to a point where these, these are the things that all birds have in common. And there are no, there's no sarcastic answer that our, that our uh, friend here can give that actually is all the things that we stated but isn't a bird. Now, usually we have like when we're doing this, you know, sort of thing, when we're trying to come up with properties, we, we work in sort of the positive space. It's the same kind of thing that plagues tests. I mean, how many uh, tests have you seen in a software project where it's testing that it does exactly what they expected it to do if they give it exactly what they expected to give it, right? It's like the most common test. Like, hey, right? I mean, or, or there's another, there's a good psychological experiment where it's like, you know, you, you tell them something like, here's a sequence of numbers, like two, four, six, eight, ten, and then like they can ask you questions to find out what's next or give you prospects. And people often spend way too long giving stuff that confirms what it appears to be without asking for negative things that they would expect not to be true, right? Because actually it was the, it's like all the numbers, for instance, right? Like it's, yes is the answer to everything. Um, and, but, you know, it just, it just sounds like, it, you know, you infer this, this idea from 246A10 and then you get stuck. So uh, th this is a real huge cognitive bias applies all over the place. This idea of, you know, um, positive, like, you know, it's like curve fitting to the curve you expect and not uh, pushing yourself to look at the negative space, the inverse, the everything that you didn't expect. So that means that if we define abstractions around the things that we expect, it's very easy to scoop up other things um, because we didn't ever think about excluding those other things nearly so much as we thought about including the things that we wanted to include. So, for instance, if you were to design an abstraction about bagels, like a bagel you know, recognizer, then you, you could define it so that it definitely caught all the bagels. And, but then when you actually go to consume the bagels, you find a bunch of dogs because 
you did not actually you know, specify they should not have fur. It didn't occur to you to exclude anything. So you got the bagels, but you got too much. And then there are variations on that, like the mop abstraction, <laughs> which also is at risk of finding um, false positives for mop, and the muffin abstraction, <laughs> which delicious though some of them look, you would want to be careful. And of course the towel abstraction, all of which have their flaws. Um, so anyway, hopefully this, this shows the great danger of not like, you know, limiting both directions of your specification. So we would like extent and intent to converge into the same thing. We would like the extent to actually imply the intent and vice versa for them to be joined in some fashion. Um, if you have a set of things, whatever the attributes are that they have in common, uh, that's what, you know, that's, that's their thing. And if you turn around and look at it from that set of attributes, you'd like to get that same set of objects. Um, and in fact, we can find the places where that happens, these little islands of stability in, in whatever our universe of interest is. And, that, that science of finding those and then all kinds of variations on doing stuff with that is called formal concept analysis. And this is the thing that I am bringing to your attention if you don't already know about it or just telling you something you already know if you do already know about it. So stability. Stability is, um, it's interesting that Darwin wrote this, not Darwin, Darwin didn't write it in the 1970s. Dawkins wrote it in the 1970s, but, um, I, I noticed it recently while reading this to my daughter uh, that he characterizes uh, survival of the fittest as a special case of survival of the stable, um, in, in, by which he means it isn't actually about like life per se. Um, it's about like persisting through time with some kind of, uh, of, of sameness from moment to moment. Like a, you know, a, a rock is like a stable configuration of molecules. And uh, that too is like obeying the same, you know, the generalization of survival of the fittest. Um, and if we have a thing and it, and it persists for long enough to be noticeable or in sufficient frequency to be identifiable as the same thing, then we often give it a name. And as soon as you're tempted to give it a name, then you've pinpointed some kind of abstraction. This is straight from Wikipedia, sort of a uh, checklist of stuff that it's useful for, since because in the time I have in this talk, I won't actually be able to tell you much about what it's useful for. Um, so you'll have to take my word for that to some extent. But I think that it's got huge potential for organizing uh, our concepts. And one thing that you will see is where, like, there are so many um, inheritance hierarchies or just subtyping in general. Um, that, that start to become ad hoc. Even at the most mathematical basis, people argue about like how to organize things like monad, applicative, uh, you know, functor, et cetera. You have this sort of weird set of like, well, this thing is this thing, and this thing is also this thing, but this thing's not this thing, et cetera, whatever. Well, I think if we throw formal concept analysis at that sort of thing with a clear eye on what it is that we're interested in happening, we can actually make that sort of hierarchy of what is to be a subconcept of what actually emerged deterministically. I think that's the real promise here. Like, that's what got me interested, but also there's a lot of variations on that same idea. So here's how it works. We have a bunch of properties. We're going to in this, right now, we'll think of these as yes-no questions. Of course, as all things can be generalized, we can do a lot of other things in the, in the sort of extents of uh, formal concept analysis. But for the simplest form, um, we have properties, which are these yes-no indicator function predicates. And then we have uh, objects, which are just things about which each of those things might be true or might not be true. And then so we, what we have here is a giant matrix of Booleans. Um, however many rows, maybe infinitely many rows, maybe infinitely many columns, but some way of knowing, does this thing have this property for each property and each thing? And so this is what that looks like, narrowed down to some specific set of things. In this case, we have a bunch of like words that are bodies of water of some kind, and then like things that might be true of a body of water, such as uh, whether it's natural and whether it's inland or whatever. And so for the purposes of the next slide, take a look at channel and canal. So these two guys are the same, except one of them is artificial and one is not, according to 
the, our, our set of engines, because these things are only exist as far as our properties go, so they're all uh, limited to being defined by what's on this thing. There's no more to them than that because we've chosen these as our areas of interest. So from this, we can derive this thing called the concept lattice. And a lattice is a really wonderful uh, abstract algebra structure um, with lots and lots of uh, opportunities for getting things out of it, doing things to it, learning things from it. Um, and because we are all, uh, because of the, the nature of the organization here. So if you follow, um, the, what the concept lattice is, is everybody can follow a path to the top going through things that's true of them. And so if you look in the very middle there, you can see canal. Uh, and canal's got two ways upward it can go. It can go left or right. If it goes to the right, it hits the artificial node. And if it goes left, it hits the channel node. And so from this, we know that everything that's true about a channel is true about a canal because it's below it. And it can go through it on its way to the top. But since canal has another route to the top, which goes through artificial, it's also that. And that same idea is true of all the things here. Notice how they're clustered in sets. Um, because those, in those sets, those are effectively equivalence classes for having the same set of x's in, the, uh, in, the, in our in incidence uh, matrix. Here they are side by side, uh, just to give you a little better idea of this. So we've got a set of, uh, the, so clearly I didn't actually research the history too much, but Germans were involved, right? <laughs> Which is great because, you know, I, I like the rigor. <laughs> so we've, uh, but that's why these sets have these names, G, M, and I, right? From these like cool, you know, incidence relation, right? Um, but G, M, and I, oh, and I should mention since I guess to just to not assume too much about what people know. So a relation is like uh, a generalization, you know, it's like you can't avoid using your words you're trying to define while you're defining them. A relation is a generalization of a function that assumes a lot less. Um, a function, there's got to be, uh, you know, an arrow from each guy on the left to some guy on the right. Um, in a relation, each guy on the left doesn't actually need to go anywhere, or in fact, it can go multiple places. Um, so it's more like a bunch of pairs than, a, uh, than, than the constraints that apply to a function. Um, and so a function is a relation, but a relation isn't necessarily a function. Um, and our relation here is the answer to that question that I mentioned before, does this object have this property? So an object can have a bunch of properties, or it can have no properties, or whatever, but we can relate anything from the G's to anything in the M's. So for any subset of objects and any subset of attributes, right? For any subset of objects, there's a subset of attributes that they all have. And then for any subset of attributes, there's a bunch of objects that all have that, right? So from like these perspectives are dual and the same in some dual sense. Um, but, if they're the, but if they're truly the same, if we were to say, take a set of objects and then say like, what attributes do they all have in common? And then take that same set of attributes and say, what objects of all the objects actually have all these things? And if those were the same, that's, a, that's what they call a formal concept. That, and so those are the places, and, and the, geometrically, what those are are rectangles in the incidence graph. Oops. Ah! Here. So if you could reorder the rows and the columns for your convenience, everywhere that you could make a rectangle of any size, right, of all x's, that would be a concept. And the bigger the rectangle is, the more interesting the concept is, right? You, you want to picture, like, thousands of rows and thousands of columns here in a, in a very, like one sort of place I want to try applying this is like to the whole nutrition database, right? Like so think about everything you could ask, every sort of question you could ask about food. And then like think about everything that is known about food in some big database, right? And so now imagine sort of like properties of food, you know, that are higher level than just like these very low level questions or Sub, you know, like subfoods, for instance, right? You get sort of a subfood hierarchy. You're like, I'm, a, I'm like that other food, except that I'm like slightly more specific. Anyway, it's because the smaller incidence matrices don't really get across sort of like the, the interesting stuff that comes out of this. So the concept lattice orders the formal concepts, and it can order them even though we didn't have an order relation uh, up front, because you can make a lattice out of subsets and use uh, inclusion. So basically, if this thing is a subset of this thing, 
then you know then it's a then it then there's an ordering between them. And this is you can do this with any set. It's one of the great things about lattices. You take the power set of it, so all the subsets of a set, and then then those fall into a natural order with the set with everything in it on the left and the set with nothing in it on the right. And then in between them, you get this whole little branching thing that looks, I guess, probably like um, Pascal's triangle, plus or minus, inverted, whatever that shape is. Um, and uh, you know that's the lattice. So, and then we can find the formal concepts in pretty straightforward fashion by doing that reflection. We can take any set of objects and then say, what are the attributes they have in common? And then what are the objects that those attributes have in common? And then maybe we get back to where we started and maybe we don't, but it doesn't matter because wherever we land, that's gonna be a concept. Because when we reflect that again, now we're just gonna get back to the same thing. So many different starting sets of objects might all land on the same set of objects, but that set of objects will be a concept. And so there's a bunch of reasonably efficient ways uh, to go digging around to get your concepts all lined up. But these closure operators, which again are like, uh, it's closure is a very helpful concept because you know they're going to be idempotent. Once you once you do that reflection once, you don't have to worry that like oh I'm going to it's going to keep moving around. It, it can only change once, and so in this way we can deterministically find the concepts in any given graph. And if uh, since you've been here for a few days, you've probably maybe I don't know. I guess it's like what subculture are you in? So adjunctions are this wonderful thing that are like penetrating the overall consciousness now, right? And um, what, what we're doing here is, is very adjunctive, right? Um, in fact, it's, it's even stronger than an adjunction um, between our objects and our attributes where we have what's called an order isomorphism. And of course, an isomorphism is, a, is an adjunction. Um, but there are all these other like uh, places in here where we have these, you know, adjunction related notions. And it's, it's a great, for me, it's a great sort of conceptual idea of the adjunction. These, we're, we're building these like little islands of stability in the middle that are translating between the objects and the attributes. And that thing in the middle, that's an adjunction. And that's like, that's the, what a conceptual adjunction kind of is as well. Although I'm going to, I'll hand wave that for now because I don't want to be the guy explaining conceptual categorical theory concepts. Um, and so this, though, is just the beginning. And, I can, and that's why we have to think of this talk as sort of primarily intended for inspiration. Um, because that's like the straightforward, uh, like the crisp uh, fuzzy, or the crisp analysis. But formal concept analysis goes much beyond like the crisp constraints. And they've taken it in a bunch of different directions. You know, like anything that you do with sets, of course, you can always do with fuzzy sets, which is generalization of sets such that, or multi-sets, for instance where instead of just having a map of like thing to Boolean, which is effectively what a set is, you have a map of thing to like uh, the real, between zero and one, the unit interval, or a map to like, you know, a positive integer, whatever. And so this way you get like, you know, many other interesting properties fall out. Um, and as you can see here, we have residuated lattices and then generalized concept lattices, multi-adjoint concept lattices, you can get a feel, right? Like we can have like multiple ways through the middle. Anyway, these like it's it sounds like nuts, I know, but it's the you know there's real potential here. Now, what time is it? Where's my clock? I don't. Well, am I over already? You're right on the nose. Great, we're just in time then, because see, it's called bonus. Um, <laughs> so, you may be familiar with the ladder of functional programming, um, which of course originates from. Uh, John and Co. And since I, I, I try to see the funny side of things, there's a certain amount of criticism the latter functional programming received um, for being, let's say, overly prescriptive when it was first introduced, maybe even to this day. And the meme that really took hold, as far as I'm concerned, was profunctor optics, right? It's like, do we really, like, are we all like building toward profunctor optics? Is that what it's really all about? Like, I'll be agnostic about that. Profunctor optics are legitimately useful. Um, but just, just there's, a, there's a particular aspect of, of formal concept analysis I thought would work well here. So anyway, a profunctor is like a generalization of a relation. Um, and, and here we have a little explanation from Wikipedia on brutal mode um, about, <laughs> about we should call them distributors instead of profunctors um, because they, are, they generalize a functor in the same way that a distribution generalizes a function. Don't worry about that. Important thing, though, is that 
uh, the ladder of functional programming, which of course we can't read here, but let's zoom in. And then we start seeing these like cool creatures, either ice or fire or possibly other like, you know, of the fundamental elements. But going to the very last, the bottom, the last thing, <laughs> profunctor optics, but, but wait, but wait, there's more. So that, that, the informal concept analysis, we have this relation I, which is in fact a, a profunctor enriched in truth values. We have to go to enriched category theory. Category theory wasn't good enough for us, <laughs> right? But the concept lattice is at the center of the adjunction. It is the nucleus of the profunctor. I didn't make this up. This is actually true. <laughs> so I thought we had to introduce a new level <laughs> to the functional programming ladder. <laughs> Profunctor nuclei. <laughs> and then you can just basically, you, you throw the mic down and that's it, right? There's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing else to know. So um, I guess I'm out of time, unfortunately. Otherwise, I would gladly take your questions. Uh, I, I'll take your questions anyway if you want. But uh, anyway, that's the end of my material for today. So um, thank you very much. <laughs>